As a dermatologist, I have a lot of tools at my disposal to help my patients achieve their skin and beauty goals. And I have actually tried a lot of them on myself. So today I am talking about all of the cosmetic procedures that I personally have had done. I'm Dr. Sam Ellis and I'm a board certified dermatologist. I'm here to help you understand your skin and find skincare products that work for you. If you like what you see, like this video and subscribe to the channel. I really hesitated to make this video for a couple of reasons. The main one being that I did not want anyone watching this video to feel any type of pressure or influence to have a cosmetic procedure done. This is purely informational for people out there who want to know more about cosmetic procedures and are interested in hearing that from a dermatologist perspective who has also been on the patient side of things. The other reason I kind of hesitated to share this is just like the fear of being judged, which is absolutely ridiculous. I'm here on YouTube, which is judgment central, but I figured that for every person who's going to judge me in a negative way for having cosmetic treatments done, there's probably another person out there who's seeking more information about cosmetic treatments and who will find this video helpful or interesting or destigmatizing. And so for that reason, I am going to share. I also wanted to make this video to show you that I practice what I preach. So I do a lot of cosmetic dermatology in my practice in addition to being a medical dermatologist. And I feel like sometimes patients are like, can she walk the walk? Yeah, let me tell you, I've had a lot of things done. We will get into it. But I also wanted to show you that cosmetic treatments don't have to make you look super unnatural or weird or done or overdone. I think that if you do little bits in lots of places, these tiny tweaks here and there, you can really truly maintain your appearance and look like you and not like you've had a lot of work done, but just age maybe a little more gracefully or have a beautification procedure that makes you feel more confident while still looking like yourself. Let's start with the injectables um, and we'll start with Botox. So Botox is really the brand name of one type of injectable neuromodulator. And a neuromodulator is a protein that has been specifically engineered so that when it is injected into the muscles of the face or other parts of the body, it decreases muscle movement. So Botox really does not change the shape or contour of your face very much. It's really to decrease repetitive muscle movements. So scowling over and over might lead to the formation of grooves between the eyebrows. So Botox can help with that. Or if you raise your eyebrows over and over and over again, you can start to develop horizontal lines in the forehead. So by injecting Botox, you would prevent such an intense elevation of the brows so that those creases don't form. Another common place it's injected is in the crow's feet so that when you smile, you might not get the same intense creasing because if you continue to crease years and years and years down the line, those creases are eventually going to etch into your face and become permanent. So Botox can be used to reverse some of that to some degree, but also to prevent it from ever happening in the future. For some context, I am 32 years old now. I started getting Botox when I was 26 and I did not start getting it to prevent lines from forming. I actually do not have a very expressive face at baseline. I don't raise my eyebrows a lot naturally when I talk. I don't scowl a lot when I'm concentrating. The reason I started getting Botox was twofold. One was to give myself a brow lift. So by relaxing some of the downward pulling muscles around my brows and around my eyes, I could get a little bit of lift and a little more arch in my eyebrow, which I really like because my normal brow shape is super flat and you combine that with very deep set eyes and I just, I felt like I always looked a little bit tired and angry. So I use Botox not to prevent wrinkles so much, especially at my age, but more just to lift the brow, open the eye, give a little bit more of an awake, alert, happy appearance. The other place I started doing Botox was in my masseter muscles and the masseters are a bulky chewing muscle at the back of the jaw here. It's one of the main ones where if you were to put your hands here and clench your teeth together, you will feel it bulge a little bit. Some people might feel it bulge a lot. And for people who have a large masseter muscle, it can really make your face look very round. And so I wanted a little bit of slimming of my lower face. And by injecting Botox here, that muscle was not able to activate as intensely. I could still totally chew completely fine, but I was not able to clench and grind my teeth as much. So over time, decreased activation of that muscle led to slimming of the muscle and then slimming of my lower face. So those are kind of the areas that I do Botox the most often is between the brows, 
and at the tail of my brow to give a brow lift. I do a tiny bit of Botox in my forehead so I can still move my brows, but I don't, I can't move them to the point where I make creases with my brows. And then I do my masseter muscles. Other places I've injected Botox in the past are in my chin to help with a pebbly chin. So if you make a kissy face and you get this kind of dimpling of the chin, I think I can do it now because I have no Botox in there. Or if you do this, isn't that a cute face? You have all that pebbling. Over time, that can lead to a lot of textural change of the chin. So that is a place that I will maybe twice a year do Botox in there as well, just to prevent that from ever getting out of control. There's one other place that I forgot that I inject Botox, which is into my neck. There are many muscles in the neck, but there is one superficial muscle called the platysma. And this is more of a sheet-like muscle that sort of covers the whole surface of the neck and kind of grabs onto the tissues of the lower face as it crosses the jawline. And so over time, that platysma muscle is constantly pulling down, down, down on your facial structures. So by relaxing that, you can enhance the appearance of the jawline, but also prevent those lower facial structures from being tugged on. So gravity is enough downward pull for me. I don't need another muscle doing that as well. The other thing is as we age, you can get something called platysmal banding. And it is a classic sign of an aging neck when you start to see these broad, muscular fibrous bands that are visible through the skin and that can make the neck look older and more masculine. And so we can inject along those bands and that's what I do in my own neck to kind of get the platysma to fully relax and make the neck look a lot more seamless and feminine. So that is the other place that I do Botox. So it's not just for the face. When I'm doing cosmetic consultations with my patients, I kind of tell them the best and worst thing about Botox is that it doesn't last forever. So if you hate it, it's gonna wear off completely and you'll be no worse off for it. And if you love it, you need to continually do it to maintain the results. It's like anything, it's like dyeing your hair. Uh, if you really like it, you're gonna do it periodically to maintain the appearance. The same goes for Botox. Botox lasts for a different amount of time in different people. And that really depends on your body chemistry, how high of a dose you're getting, how it's being injected, a little bit of technique. So all of those things will influence it. For most people, Botox will last three to four months. And I would say the majority of my patients based on that see me somewhere between three and four times a year. I personally inject my Botox about every four months, so three times a year. I do my masters closer to twice a year just because now that I've been doing it for so long, it takes a lot longer for that muscle bulk to reaccumulate. Moving on, to fillers, which is a totally different category of injectables. It is not anything like Botox, even though I feel like sometimes people think they do the same things. They do totally different things. So remember, Botox is to relax muscles, to prevent repetitive muscle movements, to decrease the risk of forming wrinkles over time from like continually doing the same movement over and over and over again. Fillers, on the other hand, refer to a broad category of injectables that are used to create contour and shape in the face because fillers, when injected into tissue, take up space. They put volume into tissue. They tend to have a gel-like texture and can be different thicknesses of gels depending on what brand and subtype of filler you're using. But the whole point of them is to change the shape of of the face. So you can create cheeks if someone has very flat cheeks. You can enhance lip volume. And then of course they can also be placed very, very superficially in the tissue to fill in fine lines. I don't have a ton of filler in my face yet. It's not that I'm opposed to it. In my practice, I sort of use it for two main things. One is for restoring facial features once the aging process starts to take over. So oftentimes we'll notice that the fat pads, so the deep kind of compartments of the face start to sag or flatten out and fall forward. And so we can use filler to restructure the face and essentially restore some of the features that were previously there. So that's what I tend to do in patients who might be in their late 30s, 40s, 50s, sometimes in their early 30s, depending on their genetics and what kind of environmental exposures they've had in their lifetime. So it's more of like an anti-aging type of injection. The other thing I use filler for a lot in my practice, especially in my younger patients, is more for beautification. So not to anti-age someone, but really to enhance or create a feature that was not there before. So that might be lip filler to create lip volume. It might be chin and jawline injections to give chin projection or jawline contouring. It might be tear trough injections to reduce some hollowness under the eyes. So when I'm using filler in myself, I'm not using it in an anti-aging capacity. Well, maybe for one thing, I'll get to that. I'm using it more as a beautification procedure. There are three places in my face that I have 
filler. The main one is in my lips. So I started getting lip filler when I was 28, maybe 29. I just always felt like my top lip was really, really thin. My bottom lip wasn't like really big either. And obviously they're not huge now, but they were smaller before. I have always done my own lip injections on myself as I've done all my Botox on myself. I don't recommend that. Uh, it's not my professional recommendation, but I just have such a control like tendency um, that I know that I want to do it to myself. And uh, if I didn't like it, then there's no one else to blame. And I don't have to feel bad telling someone that I don't like their work. So I do all of my own lip injections, but that is something that makes me feel a lot more confident. Really, like I said, I only do it about once a year. I don't don't ever want to have larger lips than I have. Now I just sort of want to maintain this volume for forever. Lip filler lasts different lengths of time in different people. It also depends what type of filler, what brand of filler, how much filler was put in, etc. So I feel like by doing it annually, I'm never gonna go overboard. I definitely have patients who I see every six to nine months because they metabolize the filler faster or they're working toward making their lips larger. So I will see them until we kind of hit the size and shape that they want. And then we'll do maintenance injections probably just annually. I'm very conservative with my lip filler because I don't want my patients out there looking like they had anything done. My biggest compliment is like when people are like, oh, I didn't know you had lip filler. I'm like, perfect. The other two places that I put filler are to actually fill in a line that's becoming etched in. And I put it right here in this part of my smile line because when I talk or smile, the skin has begun to crease in a way that's leaving a permanent line in the skin. And it cannot be prevented completely. I mean, I guess it could if I never talked or smiled again. And even with filler, it's going to still form, but maybe a little more slowly. So I put a little bit of filler almost in like a sheet like injection to sort of fortify the tissue there so that it doesn't want to crease as intensely when I talk and smile. And I do that same type of an injection in my mental crease, which is the line that begins to form between the chin and the lower part of the lip. And I just put a very thin little bit of filler in there to sort of fortify that skin as well. So those are the only places in my face that I have filler right now or have ever put filler are here, here, and in my lips. The only other type of injection that I've had done is something called Kybella. And Kybella is sort of traditionally thought of as the fat melting injection because it is, well, the generic of this is deoxycholic acid. And deoxycholic acid is really an acid found in the GI tract that dissolves fat that we eat, uh, but it has been modified and patented to be injected into the subcutaneous tissues under the skin to dissolve fat in those places. Last year, maybe it was the year before, I don't know, 2020 is a blur. I had two rounds of Kybella injections under my chin to dissolve my double chin. And like, it was not really a full on double chin. It was just in certain photos or in certain angles, just have a little fat pooch there. And it was one of those things where like, I have a normal body weight, no matter how thin I would ever get, I would always have this pooch there. Thanks dad. And it's just totally hereditary. So I wanted that gone. Kybella injections are one way to do that. They are typically spaced anywhere from like six to eight weeks apart. And each time you have it injected, it dissolves a little bit more fat and it does so permanently. It is not my ideal way to remove fat from the body. Liposuction, which is surgical, is way more effective, works way faster. But for someone who has a very small amount of fat that like, there's no way I was ever going to do liposuction for this. That's when Kybella becomes a good alternative. Let's move on to laser resurfacing because that is sort of the mainstay of how I keep my skin as clear as possible. I did a lot of damage to my skin growing up. I was a swimmer. I played water polo through college, lots and lots and lots of sun exposure. I mean, in California, so no indoor pools. Did I wear sunscreen? Absolutely not. You should see how tan I am on my 16 year old driver's license. So this has been damaged a lot. I am doing my best with skincare to reverse it, but sometimes you just need to bring a machine to the party. For my redness, so for my rosacea, but also probably just some dilated blood vessels on my face from chronic sun damage, I get V-Beam treatments. And V-Beam is one brand of a pulse dye laser. And a pulse dye laser is a specialized laser that is used to target red structures in the skin, namely blood and blood vessels. V-Beam treatments, they take like five to 10 minutes to do. You have to target the settings very specifically based on the depth of the blood vessels, the size of the blood vessels, where they are on the face. So it takes a lot of finesse to get a good result. It's like a workhorse in my practice for people who have 
unwanted redness on their face. So I get V-beam treatments done probably about twice a year. Initially, when I was getting my redness under control, I did a series of, I think, three about a month apart to kind of knock back a lot of those dilated blood vessels on my face. And now I do it twice a year. I would do it more often than that because I feel like I always have a little bit of redness, but I get so swollen from the treatment. Like I look like I got attacked by bees afterward for like a week. That's not the norm. Not everyone gets as swollen as I do. Most patients are like, yeah, I was fine the next day, but I warn my patients like you could be as swollen as me. And sometimes I'll show you a photo if you're really nice to me and it's very embarrassing, but I do V-beam treatments twice a year to keep my redness in check, to keep my flushing in check, to just make me feel like people are seeing my skin and not my redness. The other laser that I do regularly on myself is something called the Clear and Brilliant Laser. This is a very gentle resurfacing laser meant to target just overall skin tone and texture. It doesn't help with reds in the skin at all, which is what I use B-Beam for. It helps more with brown spots. If you have melasma, it's been shown to help improve melasma and it can help reduce the appearance of pores and just overall promote new healthy collagen. The reason I like Clear and Brilliant is because it's so gentle that there's essentially no downtime. I'm pink for the day like of treatment and then that evening I could like put on makeup and go out to dinner and nobody would know. The only thing that really happens in the couple days following treatment is your face feels a little sandpapery and that's essentially all of those laser beams have treated little columns of skin that are sort of making their way to the skin surface and slowly sloughing off. So Clear and Brilliant is something that I do pretty much quarterly, so four times a year, to just keep my skin as even as possible to reverse some of the UV damage that I've had done. The final cosmetic treatment that I do in the office is something called Ultherapy. Ultherapy uses highly focused ultrasound energy and really ultrasound heat to generate new collagen in the deeper layers of the face and the neck and the chest and anywhere on the body that you wanna use it, but beyond the skin. So a lot of what I've talked about, like lasers, it's very surface. And sometimes you need something that's going a little bit deeper than that. And that's what I use Ultherapy for in my practice on myself and on my patients. I got my first Ultherapy treatment when I was 30, so I will be doing another one soon because I plan to do them every two years. Most of my patients do them every two to three years. And it really is to address skin laxity. And you might be looking at me and being like, skin laxity, what are you talking about? And I'm using it in a preventative measure. So I have accrued a lot of UV damage over time. I know that my collagen production is going to slow down with time as well as my collagen breakdown is going to speed up with time. So I need every possible tool that I can use to get my body to produce new collagen. And Ultherapy is what I'm using to help produce new collagen in the deeper layers of my face. It's not going to lift someone's face like a facelift will, but you can absolutely see really nice tightening in the lower face, like near the jowls, under the chin, in the neck, I use a lot in the decollete to help with chest wrinkles. I personally use it on myself, under my chin, and on my lower face. And that is really just to prevent sinking and sagging over time. When I'm doing consultations for skin laxity in my practice, a lot of patients are like, well, is Ultherapy worth it? Because it is a more expensive procedure compared to some other things. And the results can be modest. And I always tell people it's not up to me to decide what is worth it for you. But I've had so many happy patients with it. There's a lot of information online about Ultherapy, people who've had amazing results and people who've not been happy with their results. I cannot tell you how user dependent this machine is. There is a lot of technique that goes into giving someone a good Ultherapy treatment. And if you have someone using Ultherapy on your face willy nilly, yeah, there's a great chance that you're not gonna see any type of result. But when I do Ultherapy on my patients, I don't know, I've got the technique down. I, I'm visualizing as I'm treating someone. So the Ultherapy comes from ultrasound. I'm looking on an ultrasound screen, visualizing the patient's tissues as I'm treating them. So I can see exactly what I'm targeting. I can adjust my settings based on the patient and their goals. So it's not always about what machine is being used or what injectable is being used. It's also about the person behind the machine or behind the syringe. So there you have it. That is a summary of all of the cosmetic treatments that I've had done. I will keep you updated. If I try something new or do something new, I will absolutely let you know. If you follow me on Instagram, sometimes I'll take you through a treatment while I'm having it done. So if you don't already follow me on Instagram at Dr. Samantha Ellis, you should. I'm so curious if you've 
had any of the cosmetic procedures that I talked about, and I would love to know what your experience is. If you have a favorite cosmetic procedure that you've ever had done, would also love to know. I definitely plan on going into more detail about these various procedures in the future. This was more of a video just to tell you about my personal experience, but thank you for staying with me. I'm so happy that you're here. I will see you next time. Thank you.